be put forward uh, that uh, does not seem to be acceptable. Uh, one of which is that he talked about the immensity of God's mercy and that he was raising question about, you know, hell and all that because uh, uh, so it, it did not in a way uh, stand very well with the mainstream teaching of the church. Uh, but he was in a way uh, an example also uh, of somebody who took his faith very seriously. It's just that uh, uh, he, he followed a different path. Okay. Uh, he is referred to uh, also somehow as one of the articulate fathers of the church, but uh, uh, he's not, uh, he's, uh, actually some people would even question whether uh, that category should be given to him. Thank you, Father. <clears throat> okay. So because he was so, uh, he wanted to control himself, he thought he would be able to solve his uh, problem of concupiscence, you know, and uh, last by castrating himself. I don't know if, I don't know if he was able to succeed that <laughs> in, in having, having himself castrated. That's why uh, uh, no, they're, they're, they're saying that before you get ordained, you will have to uh, be scrutinized. And tawag nila is coming from the scrotum. No, scrutiny. You you are going to be scrutinized on that on that regard. But it's uh, you know that's a joke that Father Jimmy would always tell us uh, before. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are there any questions? Are there other questions? Uh, Father, excuse me. Yes, Father Stanley. I want to know something. One thing, Father, uh, I cannot fully understand the last chapter or last uh, last section, uh, the historical development of moral theology. But yes. The uh, era, sixth uh, century, but between sixth century and eleven and thirteenth century, there's a little gap. I think seven, eight, nine, ten. So what area? It is. Ah, okay. Uh, because the the Middle Ages uh, must could be considered to have started sometime also in the eighth century, up to uh, the time of the Renaissance, which actually is in the thirteenth century in Italy at least. Okay, because uh, the Renaissance uh, was already a period uh, that people would refer to as the beginning of modernity. Uh, when you speak about the Middle Ages, that according uh, to the periodization done uh, by modern scholars, no historians in particular, okay, they would refer to that period where everything was under the control of the church. Okay, that's the middle, that's the medieval age. Uh, that is that is the dark ages. They would say that's why after the dark ages, uh, they talk about modernity uh, giving way. Uh, two enlightenment periods. So people got enlightened, uh, as the, starting with the Renaissance period. So uh, normally, uh, the patristic period could go as late as uh, seventh, century, seventh century, and then uh, eighth up to uh, the thirteenth century. I think is the period of the medieval ages. Of course, uh, you know it's it's not really. Uh, the periodization actually uh, cannot cannot stand, you know, scrutiny very easily because, you know, there were there may be significant events that may have started it, but it is a gradual process. You don't you don't say it stops here and then it begins there. No, it, it's it's just a period that people refer to where transitions happen, and sometimes transition happens within a period of like a century or so. So it's it's uh, I think it's not uh, it's not very clear uh, as far as the division is concerned. But what is important in our study is we are able to locate you know certain transitions that eventually gave way to a new period. Okay, uh, what when exactly uh, would that would that happen? Uh, that's not of most importance to us. The most important thing is that period is characterized by this or that, etc. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Yeah, okay. Okay. 
Thank you. Now, uh, we were saying that in the 17th to 18th centuries, okay, as far as moral theology is concerned, okay, uh, we said that as a result of, no, you are, you are talking here of, of, the, of what was going on in the church huh, internally. Of course, there were different influences uh, that the church had to uh, be exposed to, okay? And that is the reason why they actually gave way to certain modes of rationality or thinking, ethical thinking within the church. For example, uh, in during this period uh, from the 17th to 18th century, okay, we have we identify that as a result of, of the Reformation uh, reaction to the the counter reaction to the Reformation, especially to the Council of Trent, uh, there ensued a different kinds of, of moral ways of reasoning, okay? Uh, debates among moralists developed, and actually th this gave way uh, to uh, development of moral systems. The, the first one uh, we would say is uh, Jansenism, uh, for the Vincentians, they're familiar with Jansenism. I'm going to ask one of them to explain what this is. Uh, this happened also during the time of Vincent de Paul, who lived also during the 17th century. And then there was also another school uh, that was referred to as Laxism, okay, influenced by the development in the world, okay? Uh, all this liberalism and all that, where people in the world uh, were clamoring and were actually over exaggerating uh, the call for freedom, okay? And then probabilism wanted to stand in the between. And we will try to navigate on how they wanted to, to locate themselves in between two extreme positions. Jansenism, let's start with Jansenism. Okay, this, by the way, uh, this particular period uh, that extended up to Actually, more recent times, huh? even before Vatican II, as was demonstrated by <coughs> by, by James Kinnan in his article, <coughs> uh, continued on like the man was. <coughs> Sorry. This was the period of the casuistry and manuals. What do you mean by casuistry? Casuistry means this is moving on with trying to understand uh, moral positions on the basis of the application of moral principles to particular cases, okay? So you are confronted with moral cases, moral dilemma, and uh, what you do is you try uh, to apply certain moral principles in those moral dilemmas. And that's, you, you call that cas casuistic thinking, okay? And, uh, of course, also during this period, uh, what uh, had become the solution uh, to, in a way, anticipate as much as possible responses to moral dilemma is to come up with manuals. Manuals are actually resolutions of certain, uh, uh, of, uh, resolutions given to certain dilemmas uh, that are now encoded that are made available uh, for moral uh, moralists in the church. And during this period, most of them have been identified as kind of lawyers, you see? Uh, they are very much identified with the law and that therefore uh, the experts of the law are the kind of lawyers. And therefore uh, they almost got identified as the moral theologians during this time. Okay, let's move on. Uh, within this particular period, as, I, as we said, there were two or three schools that emerged in their attempt not to be able to uh, deal with some cases or moral questions during the time. The first case is that of Jansenism. When you speak of Jansenism, you immediately identify this with ethical rigorism. Okay, when you say rigorism, it is a very strict way 
of following uh, the moral demands. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a claim uh, during the time of Jansen, okay, uh, that only very few will be saved. Precisely, only very few uh, will be able to really follow uh, the demand, the rigorous demands of the gospel. Okay, so let's. Uh, Cornelius Jansen actually hailed from the Catholic University of Leuven. Okay, there are two. Jansen's uh, who actually hailed from Leuven, who became very famous in moral theology at least. One was Cornelius Jansen, and the other one is Louis Jansen's. We're going to touch on Louis Jansen's later on in the development of moral theology. But uh, for the meantime, let's talk about Cornelius Jansen. Okay. Uh, according to Cornelius Jansen, okay, and then let me ask first. Uh, the Vincentian seminarians, what do they remember about Jansenism? Uh, RC, uh, you have just oh, finished. Father. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, James. Um, actually, <laughs> um, um, I forgot his name, Father, but uh, there was a. Uh, there uh, the there was uh, the abbot. Uh, yeah, the abbot. abbot yes, it was, yes, 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 it was yes. close to Saint Saint Vincent, yes. and, and they were they were really close friends. The thing is, Vin Saint Vincent never condemned, like uh, in, in personally, in, he did not condemn him. I remember in our discussion, but uh, uh, the, the 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 idea came. Uh, Jansenism came during the time of Saint Vincent de Paul. It was yeah. uh, prevalent during the time of Saint Vincent de Paul. Yes, that's right. Uh, and of course, uh, Vincent de Paul's canonization almost was not able to push through or was delayed for some time precisely because of his association uh, with uh, the abbot of, uh, I think, uh, Cip uh, what is this? Uh, Cyprian. Uh, Cyprian. Uh, Cyprian. Yes. yes, Cyprian, yes. And, uh, but of course, uh, later on it was proven uh, that Vincent de Paul was at the forefront of uh, trying to, con to counteract Jansenism during his time. In fact, there was even a time when he organized a conference against Jansenism per se. But of course, uh, uh, what was it that uh, Vincent was not happy about Jansenism? Uh, what was the, the teaching of Jansenism? Uh, anyone? Uh, Vincentian? Do you remember? What was the teaching of Jansenism? That you remember? Uh, Father Parang. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Uh, First, parang ano yung in emphasize it emphasizes uh, primarily the the existence of sins and uh, at some point he sees the human person as like uh, someone very vulnerable to to sin and that he is uh, sinning and uh, after that uh, it also speaks about the grace of God something like. Uh, like the people should not anymore do some some works of charity or some something like uh, because the the grace of God is uh, parang compensate or something like it's it's enough or something like God has predestined already those who will be saved and those who are not parang yun yung naalala ko father okay okay so that's the reason why they speak of a very limited uh, avenue for redemption no, for people. And uh, usually the, the Christ, the crucified Christ, is always portrayed this way. Not that open arm, no, but it's actually like this. If you can see me, can you see me? Yeah, yes. like that. Okay. So, and th there was a very strong uh, debate, especially between the Jansenists and the Jesuits, especially during the time, because the Jesuits uh, were also more uh, emphasizing the compassion, okay, the mercy of God, 
And also, uh, in terms of liturgy, the Jansenists would, as much as possible, uh, do with the whole concept of, of uh, like, uh, the sacred heart, the whole devotions and all that, no? which actually was emphasized uh, by the Jesuits. Now, uh, Cornelius Jansen, Jansen actually uh, started considering that there were fundamental problems uh, in theology during his time. First is that there was a very strong tendency to Pelagian views you know, among theologians. By now, you already may have an understanding of what Pelagian views are all about. Okay, Pelagian views, which means uh, it, it has a very optimistic understanding of humanity and that humanity can save, can be saved uh, also through his own efforts alone and that Christ came only to set very good examples of what it means to live a perfect human life. So it, down, it downplays the role of grace, okay? Second, he problematizes the fact that there has been a neglect of the study of the fathers of the church, particularly uh, St. Augustine, okay? There were a lot of studies on, you know, contemporary developments during the time. You remember uh, during the time of, uh, of Vincent de Paul, the devout humanism, for example, of uh, uh, St. Francis de Sales was prevalent during the time. No? The humanity is, is uh, very, almost like very, uh, very good. And, uh, it, you know, it, it talks about uh, hum, hum, humanity in a very optimistic way, okay? Influenced by the development of humanism during the time. Okay? And he talks also about the problem of laxity of confess confessors in imparting absolution. Parang it was so easy okay, for uh, penitents to receive forgiveness for their sins and immediately receive communion. So rather, uh, he calls for an absolute need uh, for strict discipline in the church. You cannot be receiving communion almost as often as you would like to uh, because uh, you are always somehow marked with human sinfulness and that you need to have a rigorous discipline to be able to prepare yourself to be able to receive Christ. So as a reaction uh, to this problematics that he identified, uh, Cornelius Janssen actually did for his research uh, uh, Augustinus, that is about St. Augustine, and there, he actually emphasized okay, the following points. The first is about the sinful nature of humans. Humanity is sinful. Uh, following St. Augustine, he talks about akrasiya, now the woundedness of humanity because of the presence of original sin. Okay? And then he talks about that there was no supernatural grace before the fall, okay? Because uh, if you were to talk about the supernatural grace before the fall, okay, uh, that would uh, not give possibility for humans because that, that would mean that humanity, okay, before the fall, it speaks about the natural condition of humans and therefore uh, it is not part of his nature uh, to have that supernatural uh, divine character in him because precisely uh, because uh, he is just an ordinary human being and, and grace according to Cornelius was just the sufficient grace that God makes uh, available for humans uh, to be able to uh, efficaciously in a way, uh, do good in his life. What what is what the, the grace that is made made available made available to humans is just what will enable him to become good, coming from uh, Christ's own uh, self giving. Human freedom means without 
physical constraint. Human freedom is understood only in terms of that, okay, without physical constraint. And therefore, he emphasized, he emphasized in his uh, study of Augustinus the importance of human accountability, okay? So all of this made uh, the Jansenists, the followers of Cornelius Jansen's, to be very rigorous in their own uh, following of Jesus. Maybe during our time, maybe you can speak about the rigors that we see among the Opus Dei. Of course, we are not saying that that's what they teach, but uh, you can see the discipline. You have to go to confession <coughs> as much as you can before you receive communion and all that. You know, that, that kind of rigorism. Okay. On the other hand, there was also, uh, during this time, another school of thought that emphasized tremendous, uh, tremendously uh, the freedom that humanity should be able to enjoy. Okay? Uh, this, uh, this kind of school of thought or the movement in ethics was called laxism. It was reacting uh, to all forms of institutions uh, that were trying to limit the possibilities of humans to exercise his or her own freedom. Of course, the influences, the influences here comes from the humanist tradition, okay, from the liberal tradition that was already flourishing during this time as part also of the modern project. You know very well that eventually in uh, 17, that was already part of the 18th century, especially you now in uh, 1776, you have the American uh, liberation. Then you have the French Revolution, American Revolution, uh, 1776. And then you have the French Revolution in 1789, but that was already part of the 18th century. Okay, that somehow there was a collapse of traditional moral standards, okay? And that somehow freedom was highly emphasized during this time, and that gave way precisely to the experience of liberation. <clears throat> okay. So the, this we would say as the political roots of the liberal tradition. Now, we, there, there was a, another school of thought in ethics that tried to navigate in the between, okay, the two extreme positions. Uh, they, 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 they call this system probabilism. Probabilism <coughs> actually has been very much identified with the work of Bartolome de Medina, who lived from 1527 to 1581. Okay, and his work impacted uh, on this century, on the uh, 17th century. What is actually assumed in probabilism? When there is a genuine division of expert opinion on a specific moral issue, and therefore two probable opinions, one may feel free to follow the more lenient opinion, even if, even if it is held only by the minority experts. You understand? So if there are, you know, varying opinion on, on certain situations, okay, uh, you follow the more lenient one. So just like in the general principle in the law, for example, um, there will be questions whether is this particular law applicable in this particular case? So the more a strict uh, moralist would say, yes, it is. And therefore, you should not do that. But there is another opinion that says, no, that principle does not apply to this. And according to probabilism as a system of moral reasoning, you follow the more lenient one. Okay? Is there a presence of the law or not? Okay, uh, how do you appreciate uh, reality as is? Uh, you go for a more lenient position. 
but uh, the, some would found would find some problems with probabilism and would further uh, qualify uh, we qualify this system and uh, they came up with a new uh, more new one system they call probabiliori probabiliorism okay what do you mean by probabiliorism in case of doubts in case of doubt, one must follow the more probable opinion, okay? So if you have a kind of a doubt about certain reality of the law, okay, you, you, you follow the more probable opinion. Yeah, that's why probabilior, uh, which means more probable opinion. Uh, for example, uh, you are doing hunting. Okay, uh, and then you see uh, somehow there was a movement there in the grass. Would you shoot it or not? So what would be the more probable opinion? Okay, uh, could that be a human person or could that be an animal that you need to hunt? So for you to be able uh, to take on a more probable opinion, you need to do a little more verification. Okay. Or, for example, in the, in the consideration of whether are there existing laws uh, that uh, prohibit you from doing it, okay, the more probable opinion, again, uh, is uh, to take on uh, some verification of the situation. According to Alphonsus de Ligori, okay, who is the founder of the uh, redemptorists, okay, and who is also considered as the uh, father of moral theology, Catholic moral theology, okay. He spoke about uh, the importance of equi probabilism. It is not the more probable opinion, etc., but it it is a more balanced uh, appreciation of the cases. Equi probabilism is slightly more strict alternative to probabilism, okay? A system of principles designed to guide the conscience of one in doubt whether he is free from or bound by a given civil or religious law, okay? So this one is a little bit more uh, strict compared to uh, probabilism, which actually just take, takes on the more uh, just takes on uh, the more lenient position, okay? So manuals were largely used in the seminaries for application of moral theology in the confessional. The, therefore, there was a multiplication of laws to eliminate the exercise of freedom. You know? That was what the manuals were meant to be. Okay? They, as much as possible, uh, present cases that have been well thought of okay, by experts in moral theology or on the law and try to come up with resolutions about them okay, so that they could serve as guide okay, uh, to uh, those who are in the confessional. Okay? So what we see, uh, uh, it, you know, it keeps coming back, you know, the whole, the whole question about uh, you know, uh, becoming law-oriented, act-oriented, okay, rigorism, or you talk about uh, um, becoming more external and behavioral in the appreciation of morality uh, had always come back, and there had always been a way uh, to address this later on. Okay, there were certain uh, developments that happened in the 19th to 20th centuries. Uh, we would see that they would ev eventually find their expressions in the Second Vatican Council. Uh, what were these developments that happened during the 19th to the 20th centuries? Okay, one is the renewal of moral theology, particularly uh, that uh, started in the University of Tübingen, uh, Germany. 
Okay. Here we would see that such renewal was calling for a renewal from within our own resources as uh, in our tradition. So uh, the, the ones responsible for this uh, were John uh, Michael Saylor, Bishop of Ratisbon, and John Baptist Hirscher. Okay. They were talking about the need uh, to have a revival of scriptural studies. Okay. Uh, moral theology during the time, with, especially with manuals, almost had forgotten, you know, the inspiration that comes from the scripture. They became too rational and too casuistic that it lost sight, you know, especially with uh, high scholasticism, it lost sight of the importance of the inspiration that comes from the scripture. And it called for a more uh, charismatic moral teaching. When you say charismatic, uh, this is an approach by which you can speak about a morality, especially in terms of the need to be converted and the need to follow Jesus. So it is about, you know, it is very much tied with the Jesus' event. God loves us in our own sinfulness, and therefore as a response, we turn our back to sin and believe in the good news and then become followers of Jesus. So that is the kerygma. You know, even in the preaching of the priest, if the charismatic dimension is lost, now people will look for, for something uh, that would make them appreciate the call of the discipleship in a more tangible way. That's the reason why charismatic movements or, you know, these different groups uh, like El Shaddai have become attractive to Catholics precisely because sometimes in the Catholic Church, you do not anymore, uh, you are not able to listen anymore to charismatic moral teaching or you are not anymore able to see that priests are making testimonies of their faith, of their own conversion, of their own way of following Jesus. And this particular uh, renewal also called for, you know, uh, reestablishing the link between Christian morality and Christian spirituality and dogmatic theology. Okay? That if you want uh, to have a kind of a morality uh, that is not pallid and dry, you need to, in a way, infuse this with certain type of spirituality. Okay? That discipleship is in itself a form of spirituality. And that it, it has to be appreciated within the logic of the whole revelation of God. Okay? I starting with our appreciation of the Trinity, appreciation of the sacraments and all that in our life. All geared to becoming better disciples of Jesus. And it wants to reestablish the link with the fathers of the church along with moral psychology. You remember the patristic thinking in moral theology was more uh, sapiential rather than rational, isn't it? More wisdom-based rather than rational. It was patrist the patristic moral discourse was more attuned with the Gospels, with the wisdom of God that were made available, that was made available in the wisdom of Jesus, okay? So they wanted to go back to that. And there they speak about the theological roots of Christian ethics. That Christian ethics cannot but be theological in nature. It talks about our relationship with God. So it begins to talk again about the need for Christian virtues, etc., orienting our lives to God Himself. So that was one of the trends that happened in Vatican. In, uh, uh, in the church <coughs> that led to the Second Vatican Council. Another development that happened in the last two centuries <coughs> 
which eventually is identified with liberal Christianity or liberal moral theology, uh, were uh, the <coughs> were the thinking that came from scholars that moved away from a very negative way of looking at modern developments. You have to remember that uh, during the time of uh, Paul, uh, Pius IX, Pope Pius IX, there was a very strong indictment against modern modernism and liberalism. Uh, later on, you would study, we would study that in Catholic social tradition uh, that the Pope wrote a document okay, uh, that condemned the heresies and errors of, uh, of modernism and liberalism. Okay? Uh, that is the syllabus of errors attached to a particular encyclical that the Pope wrote during that time. That is the reason why, even at the beginning of the 20th century, Pope Pius X, you know, following this whole direction of Pius IX, actually uh, came up with the trends during the time uh, that were running after uh, Catholics, theologians, biblical scholars who were open uh, to modernism or liberalism. Okay, there were some uh, biblical scholars, very great Catholic biblical scholars, who actually tried to be open to the development in biblical scholarship, uh, like Luasi, for example. Uh, we will see that in the film uh, of uh, the good book, no? Okay. This particular uh, tendency, uh, instead of becoming anti-modernist, there was a great openness to the modern world, to its worldview and perspectives and disciplines. Okay? And we would refer to this as ad extra renewal. Representatives of this are the following. For example, this was continued through the contributions of Joseph Mausbach, Theodore Steinbuckel, and more recently, after the contribution of Bernard Herring, at the Alfonsianum, Joseph Fuchs at the Gregorian University in Rome, and then of course, Louis Jensen of the Catholic University of Leuven. They developed a more personalist perspective in moral theology uh, that eventually found their expression in the Second Vatican Council, okay? So these were some of the, ve the developments that happened uh, amidst a resistance uh, to liberalism and modernism, there were certain schools of thought uh, that were trying to uh, open the road to renewal in the church. On the one hand, the renewal in the biblical, patristic, uh, and charismatic uh, sources uh, to bring about renewal in the church, which means eventually we'll call them as ad fontes, okay? Renewal, or in French, we call that ressourcement, ressourcement, okay? That the renewal in the church that happened eventually that led to Vatican II renewal. One goes back, that ad intra, the other form of renewal is ad extra, okay? Ad intra, back to the roots, Bible, the patristics, defining our unique character, identity in the world, and clarifying our spirituality. Remember those, those uh, points that we raised, okay? Uh, that was done by the university in Tübingen, okay? Let's go back to Christ. Kerygma, uh, uh, fathers of the church, the spirituality shall be uh, re recaptured again. Okay, in doing moral theology. While in the ad extra form of renewal, uh, we would talk about the need to be open to the modern world, okay? Uh, and believe that 
God's revelation is not only found in the sacred scripture, but God continues to manifest himself in the history of our times. Reading the signs of the times becomes a source for our own response to the call of the gospel for us in our lives. So there is a need, therefore, to search for the common grounds with humanity. Because humanity is looked upon in a more positive way and is believed to have a goodwill that wants to pursue what is true, what is beautiful, what is uh, just, what is humane, etc. And that Christians should be able to find that common ground okay, with uh, all the all the humanists, or all the people who are actually uh, living in the world, even if they are not Christians, they actually have beautiful ideals of what humanity should be. And then it therefore calls for dialogue. So here we will see that dialogue was at the heart of, of the disposition uh, that the church took during the Second Vatican Council. Okay, dialogue with religions, dialogue with other faiths, Christian faith denominations, okay, dialogue with the world. And later on in the FFFABC, okay, the Federation of Bishops Conference, especially which started here in the Philippines in 1970, uh, they started uh, having their immersion uh, in 1970 when they came here, all the bishops from the different parts of, of uh, Asia, actually came up with uh, immersion in Tondo, in other uh, poor areas. And then in their articulation of the vision of FABC, they talked about the dialogue with life, dialogue with culture, dialogue with faith, okay? Or dialogue with religions. Kaya, makita mo yun, yung, yung triple, threefold type of dialogue uh, that FABC called for was an offshoot of, of uh, the whole intuition coming from the Second Vatican Council. And there, the need to read the signs of the times. Okay? So this eventually led to certain paradigm shifts which we will study in the next coming slide.